Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode, a thorny problem for the Book of Mormon and missing generations on the small plates of Nephi. Now, if that doesn't whet your appetite for a great show, I don't know what will, but I promise you this is going to be exciting stuff that we're talking about tonight. It once again has to do with that area in the Book of Mormon, that connective tissue between Jacob, the Book of Jacob, and the Book of Mosiah. And we know from primary that those books are Jacob, Enos, Jerem, Omni. And there's a host of authors who write very little in that time period. It's almost as if the author of the Book of Mormon was trying to connect and catch up from Jacob all the way up to Mosiah where he had left off writing or dictating. Remember, once again, the Book of Mormon as we have it today was first translated from the beginning of the book down to the beginning of the Book of Mosiah. That was the 116 pages that were thereafter lost. And as we discussed last week, when Joseph Smith came back to starting with the dictation of the Book of Mormon again, he started where he left off at the beginning of Mosiah, went all the way to the end of the Book of Mormon in Moroni, then came back and started with 1st Nephi chapter 1 verse 1 and worked his way up to where he had left off with Mosiah chapter 1. And that is why this area, this connective tissue between Jacob and Mosiah 1 is so interesting. Frequently, when I've read the Book of Mormon before, I have not spent a lot of time analyzing it. But I have spent some time this time. As I mentioned in the last episode, we had been up through the first 124 pages of the Book of Mormon, and I went back and I reviewed that sec- that segment of the Book of Mormon, those 124 pages, in order to look for something specific, and that was references to the small plates. We went over that last time we showed that the authors of the Book of Mormon seem to be as concerned and anxious about this missing 116 pages, explaining to the reader why it is that they're not getting what was originally on the Book of Mormon. Instead, they're getting the same time period covered on a different set of plates, what eventually ended up being called the small plates of Nephi. We went over that last week, but we showed that the Book of Mormon authors are just as anxious as Joseph Smith to make that clear to the reader, even though there's no reason that the Book of Mormon authors should care that much or be that anxious about the situation, at least not like Joseph Smith, who now has lost 116 pages and has to come up with an excuse for why it is he can translate the Book of Mormon for the same time period, the beginning up to Mosiah, and not have it replicate or be exactly the same as what was originally dictated and then lost because he was concerned that if he did that, then the people, Lucy Harris, whoever had it, would come forward with it with changes made to it. Once again, that doesn't make sense, but with changes made to the the transcript or the the translation, and say, you see, he didn't match it. It's not word for word the same. Therefore, he's a false prophet. Therefore, the Book of Mormon is not true. Okay. But I found a lot of other things as I was going through that 124 pages of the first part of the Book of Mormon, especially in this connective tissue. And I want to share that with you tonight. All right. And that's is the part about this thorny problem that the Book of Mormon has with population. Okay and the generations actually, the generations, they're missing some generations. Going back to where I started, it's easy in this connective tissue just to see, okay, here's a guy who wrote a little bit and uh, he passes it on to his son and the son writes a little bit, passes it on to his son. This is between Jacob and Mosiah. And that's what happens. And it looks like the author is just trying to catch up to where it was that the author left off. The problem is there are not enough generations to make up for that time period, not even close. When I stopped and I took the time to analyze it, count out the number of generations, do some basic math, I realized that it was extremely short on generations. There's a time period of hundreds of years. There's a certain number of generations represented in the Book of Mormon. And the problem is, is that those generations represented in the Book of Mormon by the names do not come close to filling out the time period that it is supposed to represent. So that is the thesis of this in a nutshell. All right, let's get ready and go on. Here is the slide. You can see that in the Mormon Sunday School series, this is lesson 15. 
Oh, I also wanted to talk to you about this in case there are any people who are concerned that we are spending too much time on this section of the Book of Mormon and not racing to keep up with what it is we're supposed to be reading with the rest of the class. Oh, here's the title, A Thorny Problem for the Book of Mormon, Missing Generations in the Small Plates of Nephi. Now, let me get back to my, my guided tour analogy. There it is. Just a few days ago, I was fortunate and blessed enough to be in London, England, taking a tour in the East End in the Whitechapel District. It was a Jack the Ripper tour. And this is a picture that I was able to take during that tour. Now, I and my companion were somewhat lagging behind the rest of the group. And I was concerned at some point that we might get lost. But uh, the reason we were lagging is because we were seeing so many things that we wanted to take pictures of. And if we kept up with the group, we wouldn't be able to take the pictures that we wanted. We wouldn't be able to spend the time on the things that interested us the most. And that's what I want to avoid doing here in this study or survey of the Book of Mormon that we're going through this year on Radio Free Mormon and on the Sunday School channel. If we keep up and keep racing ahead and not spending the time that I want to, and hopefully that you want to as well, with the subject matter, then we'll miss many things that can only be found by spending the time and perusing the subject matter. Don't worry about the, the rest of the group. I'll be your guide. We'll catch up with the rest of the group later. But for this time and this point, let's, let's spend a little bit more time because we're going to be doing this next week too. There are so many amazing things that I've discovered here that I want to share with you. Okay, so let's start with the subject of generations in the Book of Mormon with a basic definition of what a generation is. A generation, and this is from the Wikipedia article on the subject, a generation is all of the people born and living at about the same time regarded collectively. It also is the average period generally considered to be about 20 to 30 years during which children are born and grow up, become adults, and begin to have children. So a generation is 20 to 30 years. It could be 20, it could be 25, it can be 30. This is an average. And yet it's very important. This is what we'll be using for our analysis of the generations in the small plates of Nephi. Let's move on. Now, fortunately, fortunately, in the small plates of Nephi, Nephi does not write on the small plates and then pass it down to his children. Instead, he hands them off laterally to his brother, Jacob. So Nephi writes the first part on the small plates, hands them off to his brother, Jacob. Then Jacob hands them off to Jacob's descendants going down. The reason why I say this is great is because we really don't know when it was that Lehi was, oh, excuse me, when Nephi was born. We don't know when Lehi was born either. I mean, we can ballpark it certainly within about 20, 50 years, but we can get a much better bead on when Jacob was born because of information given to us in the Book of Mormon. Now, number one, Nephi and his brother Jacob are sons of Lehi, and they are of the same generation. Though we don't know when Nephi was born, we can make a good approximation as to when Jacob was born. We know Lehi had two sons during his eight-year sojourn in the wilderness after leaving Jerusalem in 600 BCE, and that's the date that the Book of Mormon puts on it a number of times with its 600-year prophecy of Jesus Christ. So that's why in the print at the bottom of the page of the Book of Mormon, you'll see 600 BC. And I don't know if they have BCE yet. My version is a little bit older. It still says BC at the beginning of the book. We know Lehi had two sons during his eight-year sojourn. We know Jacob was the firstborn in the wilderness, according to 2 Nephi chapter 2, 1, and that Joseph, his brother, was the secondborn, but also born in the wilderness, 2 Nephi chapter 3, verse 1. So two sons, Jacob and Joseph, in that order, being born in the wilderness during this eight-year trek with Lehi and his family. So when was Jacob born? My answer is 594 BCE, because I don't really think he could have been born any later than that. Because Lehi and his family left Jerusalem in 600 BCE, per the Book of Mormon, and Jacob being born less than eight years thereafter, right? He's born in the wilderness. He has to be born less than eight years thereafter. Jacob must have been born by 592 BCE. That's eight years after 600 BCE. Why do I put 594? Because Joseph had to be born in the wilderness at some point after Jacob was born. Jacob firstborn, Joseph secondborn. Because of that, we can estimate Jacob being born two years before the wilderness journey was over, or in other words, by 594 BCE, because we have to have time, say in 593, for Joseph to be born and they still to be in the wilderness. 
We will therefore establish Jacob's da- uh, year of birth, not date of birth, but his year of birth as 594 BCE for purposes of this study, because he could not possibly have been born any later. And that's the important part for the study is to make it so we know that he could not really have been born any later than that. He could have been born earlier. That's not going to make a difference for this study, but being born later will. So 594 BCE, Jacob's birth. Then Jacob hands the plates to his son Enos. That's Jacob chapter 7, verse 27, the last verse in the book of Jacob, where Jacob writes, And I, Jacob, saw that I must soon go down to my grave. Wherefore, I said unto my son Enos, Take these plates. And I told him the things which my brother Nephi had commanded me, and etc. And it ends with saying, And I make an end of my writing upon these plates, which writing has been small. And then he closes by saying, Brethren, adieu. Yes, the last word in the book of Jacob, adieu. But he is handing the plates off to his son, Enos. And this is demonstrating that fact from the Book of Mormon text itself. Okay, so now that we know this, the first problem that we run into, if we analyze these pages and these dates carefully, is the age of Enos. Let me tell you what I mean. Enos sees he must soon die. Enos chapter 1, verse 25 says, And it came to pass that I began to be old, and 179 years had passed away from the time that our father Lehi left Jerusalem, and I saw that I must soon go down to my grave. So he's very old at this point, whatever old is among the Nephites, because generally in societies such as this from, oh, 2,600 years ago, and they're living pretty much by themselves in a new environment, they're probably not going to have a lot of access to health care. It would be unusual for them to live to be 60, though certainly possible, 65, 70. Yeah, you're getting up there at that point. So it's unlikely people will be living to the ages that they regularly live to in a first world country today. That makes sense, doesn't it? All right. But Enos is getting old. And now we find out something, okay? Calculations relating to Enos. Enos is very old and on the verge of death, 179 years after Lehi left Jerusalem. That's what he told us back here in this verse. Remember, 179 years had passed away from the time that our father Lehi left Jerusalem. Jacob was born, once again, going back to Jacob, his dad, right? We also know, because we've established this, that Jacob was born no later than 594 BCE or six years after Lehi left Jerusalem. So Jacob's birth at 594 BCE would have been 173 years before Enos is very old and on the verge of death. And that's simply because Enos already told us it's been 179 years since Lehi left Jerusalem. We're subtracting six years from the 179 because Jacob, his dad, had to have been born at least six years later, or not more than six years later. So 179 minus six is the 173 years difference that I have calculated between Jacob's birth and his son Enos being very old and ready to pass away. Now calculations relating to Enos. If Jacob were 20 years old when Enos was born, Enos lived to be 153 years old. All right? Is that making sense? Now let me go back here and show you what it is I'm doing. So there's 173 years between the birth of Jacob and Enos being very old and about to die. So if Jacob were 20 years old when Enos was born, which would be a very normal age for a a man to have a son and begin having children. In fact, in a society such as this, they would generally be uh, marrying and having and or having children at a very early age, uh, 16, 17, 18, 19. They're certainly not waiting until the age of 25 or 26 very often, like we might be doing in the United States nowadays. Um, So if Jacob is 20 years old when Enos is born, then that's that 173 years minus 20, and we get 153 years. So if Jacob is 20 years old when Enos is born, then Enos lives to be 173 minus 20, which is 153 years. All right, so that's what I mean, that if Jacob were 20 years old when Enos was born, Enos lived to be 153 years old. This is a problem in the Book of Mormon. Two, if Jacob were 25 years old when Enos was born, Enos lived to be 148 years old. 
And that's still a problem. Even today, we don't have people living to be 148 years old. If Jacob were 30 years old when Enos was born, Enos lived to be 143 years old. And if we go all the way and say, look, if Jacob was 60 years old and right before he dies, he begets Enos, right? If Jacob were 60 years old when Enos was born, Enos lived to be 113 years old, and it's still a problem for the Book of Mormon. So this is the first problem. It's a relatively simple and easy problem to understand and calculate, and it has to be if I'm going to be able to do it. By the way, please check my math. I did it like three times over, double-checking, triple-checking. I think this is all accurate. If I've got anything wrong, please let me know in the comments. I strive for accuracy. Now, those are the calculations relating to Enos. That's why Enos and the age of Enos is the first problem that we have along these lines of generations in the uh, small plates of the Book of Mormon. So let's go to the next part. Conclusions relating to this problem number one, the age of Enos. The Book of Mormon chronology sets forth Enos as living longer than 100 years. It's really hard to calculate this in any way that's going to make any sense without Enos living quite a bit longer than 100 years. Even if Jacob were 60 years old when Enos was born, as I mentioned before, Enos would still have lived to be 113 years old. Even if Jacob were 70 years old, now I'm going all in. If Jacob were 70 years old when Enos was born, Enos would still have lived to be 103 years. Yeah, it's pretty much a problem any way you slice it. These statistics do not seem likely to reflect reality. That's the bottom line conclusion on problem number one, the age of Enos. All right, let's go to the next slide. Problem number two is the seven generations between Jacob and Mosiah the second. The seven generations between Jacob and Mosiah the second. This is going to take a little bit more calculation, but once I set forth everything, I think it flows pretty well. By the way, when we're talking about uh, fathers handing plates off to sons, we know that the Book of Mormon represents the Nephites as having come from the Old World, the Old Testament world. And in the Old Testament, primogeniture was the rule, which basically meant that all of the father's uh, possessions, blessings, whatever, went to the firstborn son. That's the primogeniture. Everybody else had to kind of um, take care of themselves. But because of that, we would expect then in the Book of Mormon, they would follow the same kind of practice and that it would be the firstborn son who would get the blessings, the possessions of the father, and also the gold plates, that that would follow that same firstborn male offspring heir line. So I would expect that the lower numbers in this 20 to 30 year range of what constitutes a generation, I would expect it to be lower by the time you get to your firstborn son. Now, certainly there could be times when it's longer than that. That would be the exception. I think it would be much more common to have a son by the time you're 20 or certainly by the time you're 25, which would be your firstborn son to hand things off to. So I am trying to structure this in such a way as to give pretty much every benefit of the doubt to the Book of Mormon and the reality of its narrative. The problem is, is that even though I do that, it keeps coming up short time and time again. And we'll see that again with this uh, second problem, the seven generations between Jacob and Mosiah II. This is the only other problem I'll be going into, so you know that there is an end in sight. Let's go through this. All right, I went through the scriptures and I found the lineage of Jacob's descendants who possessed and wrote upon the short, or excuse me, the small plates of Nephi. So there's Jacob, he was born circa 594 BCE, we know that. His son Enos, and I've given the references next to each of these individuals where they receive the plates. So Jacob hands the plates off to his son Enos. Enos hands the plates off to his son Jerem. Jerem hands the plates off to his son Omni. Omni hands the plates off to his son Amaron. Amaron breaks the pattern by handing the plates off not to his son, but to his brother, Chemish. All right? And that's his brother. So that they are of the same generation. So I have them on the same line in this chart. Then Chemish continues on and hands the plates to his son, Abinadam. And Abinadam hands the plates off to his son, Amalekai. Now, Amalekai says, I don't have any more descendants, so I'm going to hand them back to Nephi's line, which has been going on continuously and concurrently to Jacob's line, although they're not mentioned really in the Book of Mormon during this time period. We know that they exist, 
And then Amalekai now hands the plates back into Nephi's line, which has gotten down to King Benjamin. We find that happening in Omni chapter 1, verse 25. King Benjamin then has his son, King Mosiah, and this is King Mosiah the second, because King Benjamin's father, you remember, was the first Mosiah. He doesn't enter into this chart because the, the plates never went through King Mosiah the first. They go from Amalekai to King Benjamin, and then from King Benjamin to King Mosiah the second. And King Mosiah the second was made king in 124 BCE, and we find that in Mosiah 6. Well, I'll give you this verse here in a second. All right, so we see that there are one generation between Jacob and Enos, one, two to Jerem, three to Omni, four to Amaron, five to Abinadam. Remember, Chemish is of the same generation as Amaron, so we don't count him as a separate generation. Five to Abinadam, six to Amalekai. Amalekai goes over to King Benjamin. That's the same generation as Amalekai, so we don't count that separately. And the seventh generation is down to King Mosiah II. So there are seven generations between Jacob and King Mosiah II, which is why I called it the seven generations between Jacob and Mosiah II. Okay. And here's the verse. Mosiah 6.4, about Mosiah II, and the Book of Mormon comes through like a champ and gives us exactly the information we need to make our calculations here. It says, and Mosiah, and I put in parentheses the two, and Mosiah II began to reign in his father's stead. That was King Benjamin. And he began to reign in the 30th year of his age, making in the whole about 476 years from the time that Lehi left Jerusalem. All right, so Mosiah starts reigning when he's 30 years old, and the Book of Mormon text tells us this was about 476 years from the time that Lehi left Jerusalem. Well, it's a simple matter to figure out then when Mosiah II was born. So when was Mosiah II born? Mosiah II begins to reign at age 30. Mosiah 6.4, which we just read, places this at 476 years since Lehi left Jerusalem. This means Mosiah II was born 446 years since Lehi left Jerusalem, 476 minus 30 years, because that's how old he was, comes to that 446-year mark. We know Jacob was born no later than eight years after Lehi left Jerusalem. So in this calculation, we'll be using eight years after Lehi left Jerusalem, because we know that Jacob was born before eight years was up, because he was born in the wilderness, right? So 446 years minus the eight years, because we have to calculate for Jacob's being born after Lehi left Jerusalem, eight years, we're going to subtract the eight years from the 446 years, and that gives us 438 years. So what this means then is that really to a pretty, pretty close approximation within a year or two, we know that Jacob was born 438 years before Mosiah the second was born. Check my math. I think I'm correct. I've gone through it three times now. This is the fourth. Or conversely, saying the same thing the other way, Mosiah the second was born 438 years after Jacob was born. All right. So now let's look at the seven generations between Jacob and Mosiah the second. This is the same chart I had before with the same names, kind of in the same order, except instead of the scriptural reference next to the name that shows where it was that they got the plates, Instead of that, we have different numbers. So Jacob, at the top, born circa 594 BCE. Enos was born when Jacob was 25 years of age. For purposes of this analysis, we are going to assume an average of 25 years in the generations that each of these individuals was 25 years old when they had their firstborn son who would then take over the plates when they died. Jacob was born around 594 BCE. Enos was born when Jacob was 25 years of age. Once again, I'm not saying this is the way it happened. I'm saying we're going to give a, uh, an analysis using that as an average. Jerem was born when Enos was 25 years of age. Omni was born when Jerem was 25 years of age. And Amaron was born when his dad, Omni, was 25 years of age. Amaron now gives the plates to Chemish, his brother, same generation, so we don't do a separate generation calculation. Now, Chemish gives his son, Abinadam, the plates. And Abinadam was born when Chemish was 25 years of age. Once again, we're going to use the same average. So Abinadam was born when Chemish was 25 years of age. And Amalekai, Abinadam's son, was born when I put Chemish, it should be Abinadam, his dad, was 25 years of age. 
All right. So then Amalekite gives the plates over to King Benjamin, who's a contemporary, not a different generation. And King Benjamin then gives the plates to his son, King Mosiah. And for purposes of this analysis, we'll say that King Benjamin was 25 years of age when he begot King Mosiah, his son. All right. So if you look through each of these, what we have is after Jacob is born, 594 BCE around there, we have Enos is one generation. Jerem is two generations. Omni is three generations. Amaron is four generations. Abinadam now is the fifth generation. Amalekai is the sixth generation over to King Benjamin. And King Mosiah is the seventh generation in this chart. Once again, assuming 25 years of age for each father before they have their son who's going to carry on the tradition of inscribing on these plates. Seven generations between the birth of Jacob and the birth of Mosiah, the second is what we have and what the Book of Mormon presents us with. So the Book of Mormon presents seven generations between the birth of Jacob and the birth of Mosiah, the second. And the Book of Mormon also presents these seven generations as comprising 438 years. Remember that calculation we did before between the birth of Jacob and the birth of Mosiah, the second. The Book of Mormon has seven generations taking place in 438 years. And this is where the Book of Mormon runs into problems. If they had just done the years without the generations, they would have been fine. If they had just done the generations without the years, it would have been fine. The problem was trying to keep track of both of them together where problems abound. So if a Book of Mormon generation were 25 years, which is what we calculated in that chart, right? If the average length of a generation were 25 years, seven generations would last 175 years. That's seven times 25 years. Make sense? Okay. In other words, there should be 175 years between Jacob's birth and Mosiah the second's birth, if indeed that average of 25 years per generation holds up. But the Book of Mormon claims 438 years between Jacob's birth and Mosiah the second's birth. 438 years minus 175 years leaves 263 years unaccounted for. 263. That's how big this problem is. Even if we grant them being 25 years old before they have the child that they will pass the plates down to, and they've certainly been having children for years before that, before they turn 25. So 263 years would be more than 10 25-year generations missing from the genealogy. Let me explain that. There's 263 years missing. If the generation is 25 years, as we're calculating, there would be 10 of those generations of 25 years missing. Because in 263 years, 10 times 25 equals 250. And 263 years is 13 years, more than 250. Therefore, using 25 years as our average, 263 years more than would be taken for those seven generations. And that amount would itself be 10, 25 year generations missing from the genealogy. That's how off the numbers are here. It's not a little matter. It's quite big, in fact. So going to our next calculation, if a Book of Mormon generation were 30 years, I mean, let's really give the benefit of the doubt to the, the Book of Mormon beyond what any, I think, anthropologist would, would do. But Let's, let's see what happens. If we say that the average is that every father is 30 years old before he has the son to whom he's going to pass those plates off, if a Book of Mormon generation were 30 years, seven generations would last 210 years. Seven times 30 is 210, right? In other words, there should be 210 years between Jacob's birth and Mosiah the second's birth. But the Book of Mormon claims 438 years between Jacob's birth and Mosiah the second's birth. 438 years minus 210 years leaves 228 years unaccounted for. So still, even if they're 30 years old on average, per generation, that's at the very top of the range. That gives us 228 years that are unaccounted for in the Book of Mormon chronology. 228 years would be more than seven. 30-year generations missing from the genealogy. If we carry that through and use a 30-year generation, then we have a discrepancy of seven generations, more than seven generations that are missing using this kind of analysis. Because, of course, seven generations would be 210 years, 
and this is 228 years that are remaining. That's what happens. Even if a Book of Mormon generation were 30 years, there's still 228 years, too many in the chronology here. And that would account for more than 37, more than seven 30 year generations missing from the genealogy. In other words, if it were 30 years, we should have these seven generations plus another seven, but they're not mentioned. If it were 25 years, what we looked at before, we should have these seven generations plus another 10 generations, another 10 names, a father handing the plate down, father to son, father to son, father to son, 10 more generations. If it were 25 years, if it were 30 years, top of the range, we should still have seven more generations. We should have twice as many generations as we do have in the Book of Mormon is another way of looking at it, and yet we don't. Now, let's go all in on this one and give the Book of Mormon every benefit we possibly could and calculate if a Book of Mormon generation were 40 years, which is 10 years more than the top of the range of 20 to 30 years that is commonly used in these kinds of studies. Uh, it's not realistic, but let's see what happens if we give that much room for error, margin for error to the Book of Mormon. If the average length of a generation were 40 years, seven generations would be 280 years, right? Four times, or 40 times seven, 280. In other words, there should be 280 years between Jacob's birth and Mosiah the second's birth. But once again, the Book of Mormon claims 438 years between Jacob's birth and Mosiah the second's birth. 438 years minus 280 years leaves 158 years unaccounted for. Even if we grant the Book of Mormon an average of 40 years per generation, it still leaves 158 years unaccounted for. And 158 years would be about four. 40-year generations missing from the genealogy. Four 40-year generations would be 160, right? Four times 40 is 160, and that's why 158 years would be just about 44 40 40-year generations missing from the genealogy. Even if we give the Book of Mormon 40-year generations, they're still missing four generations between Jacob and Mosiah the second. That's how bad the numbers are and how far off the generations are in this section of the Book of Mormon. Conclusion now, the Book of Mormon posits 438 years between the birth of Jacob and the birth of Mosiah II. The Book of Mormon also posits seven generations between the birth of Jacob and the birth of Mosiah II. The length of a generation is considered to be 20 to 30 years. Generations of 20 to 30 years do not come close to accounting for the 438 year time span as we have seen. Even generations of 40 years do not account for the discrepancy. So the final conclusion here is, the Book of Mormon's genealogy from Jacob to Mosiah II appears to contradict the time span involved. All right, well, this is one of those things. Uh, we're off the tour now. The main tour has gone ahead. We're back here. We're examining these pages in the Book of Mormon with greater detail, we're taking snapshots, we're doing calculations, and what we're finding out, at least what I'm finding out, is stuff that I really did not know before. I want to caveat that by saying that I believe that 30 or 40 years ago, I believe I read an article by John Welch that dealt with this subject. I tried to find it again in pre preparing for this. I was not able to find it. I imagine that those of you who are better at Google than I will find it right off. But that's okay because what it did was it gave me the opportunity. By the way, I remember that John Welch also encountered some problems like we have encountered with this genealogy at this part in the Book of Mormon. But because I didn't find what he did, I had the opportunity myself to go through and do the calculations myself. And I think that my calculations pretty much line up with what I remember or recall, even though vaguely, John Welch's calculations to be. So there we have it. We have a place here in the Book of Mormon on the tour where by stopping, by smelling the roses, by looking around, by taking a few pictures, by pulling out paper and pencil and doing a few calculations, we find out that the Book of Mormon really, really goofs up here. This is a thorny problem for the Book of Mormon because the number of generations that it says occurred between Jacob's birth and Mosiah II's birth is nowhere near enough to account for the number of years that occurred 
between Jacob's birth and Mosiah II's birth. Well, that is about all for tonight. Please hit like, please hit subscribe, please leave a comment below. Please go over to RadioFreeMormon.org and leave a donation today if the spirit moves you, if you appreciate the research that we do here and that we share it with you. For all of those of you who have and continue to donate to Radio Free Mormon, thank you so much. Your donations do keep Radio Free Mormon broadcasting behind enemy lines. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time for more on this fascinating section of the Book of Mormon. Until then, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air.